Hi, brothers and sisters. Hey, this is Dave Bartosowitz. I, I wanted to give you uh, a little background of what I've been going through. I've had a number of people who are in disarray about why I'm going the direction that I'm going. Um, and also I've had a number of people who have been greatly moved and touched. And you know, even LDS people who say, hey, I love what you're doing. You're finally getting you know, out of Mormonism to continue to bash us. And um, they like the fact that I'm, I'm entering sort of a, a, new, a new phase of my journey. And I've actually had a, a person who doesn't believe in, um, in the LDS church and attends it. He is a librarian, but he actually uh, texted me today and he said, hey, you know, I love your Orthodox um, sharing. I, I love what you have gone through. It, it, uh, I feel that I am also going in that direction. And many people are these days. You know, Eastern Orthodoxy is becoming more aware of, uh, especially in the United States. Uh, you know, when we think of Orthodoxy, we think of a very conservative Russia, Serbia, Greek Orthodox. And so there are many, many individuals who are coming to understand now more and more uh, about Eastern Orthodoxy. And I think it's important. You know, it really is. I asked my dear friend when I had a show with him, uh, Sean McCraney, even though he's going in a totally different direction, I, I'm not in agreement with uh, what he's doing. But he was, he wanted to know about Eastern Orthodoxy. And he made a comment. He says, you know, I don't know anything about Orthodoxy which I thought was very interesting because someone who really learns the learns the, the understanding of Christianity and they don't know anything about orthodoxy, how do you fully understand the Christian church if you don't really fully understand the beginnings? And, um, and I think that's for everyone. I think we all who are believers, we need to know the ancient New Testament church and we need to to see what it's about was it was there really a church that was established by the apostles through Jesus to have an organization a a real church a physical church that was around and I have discovered in my experience in my journey with with uh, what has taken place I've discovered yet yes Eastern Orthodoxy was the and is the actual church that the apostles established. Now, I know there's going to be a lot of people in St. Dave, you're nuts, you're crazy. It's You can't pinpoint a one church because we are all part of that, that church. We are believers of Jesus. And I will tell you, yes, you are believers of Jesus. And I believe that I am a believer of Jesus. And I believe Orthodox are truly believers of Jesus, as well as many denominations. And I believe that you will be saved um, through your faith and, and um, how, how real that faith is and how you know Christ and how if you were connected to him and if he knows you. But I will say, after saying all that, I still believe that there was a church that the apostles established. And so I want to share my journey a little bit. I want to share why the whys and the hows and where my where my life sort of went from, you know, becoming a Roman Catholic in the beginning to being born again uh, at the age of 19 and, and then becoming a Mormon for 25 years. And after that, um, leaving that for about eight years, going around and in this non-denominational experience and then finally reading the word and coming to an understanding that that led me to orthodoxy okay because i am a catechumen and i am going that direction learning of it and uh, has blessed my life my wife's life but i wanted to give you a little heads up of of how it happened and why it happened um really it happened for the most part of reading the word of god i mean that's really the key. We have people who say, hey, sola scriptura, if, if it's in the Bible, I believe it. Well, I want you to think when I teach these, these scriptures that you evaluate them yourself and you try to think about, well, is there any truth about this? And if you do, hopefully if you have an open heart and an open mind, that it might direct your journey to another place like, like orthodoxy, okay? Let's start off in the beginning. One of the things that I was reading 
It was in Malachi 1.11. And if you wanted to read that, you, you must understand that Malachi was the last prophet that was put in the Old Testament. And clearly it was about 400 years before uh, the, 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 the four Gospels came into effect, before Christ came. It was about 400 years. He was the last prophet. But it's interesting in Malachi 1.11. It says this. And I want you to think about this when I share this with you. It says, for from the rising of the sun, rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. Now, it wasn't great then because, you know, obviously the Gentiles didn't know God at that time, right? The, the elect was the, the, the Jewish people right? So the Gentiles were pagan. They were involved in, in other ideas and other uh, beliefs that weren't really a part of knowing Yahweh. Would you agree with me? I think you would. So, but it says that, it says, my name shall be great because this was God revealing in the future that his name was going to be great among the Gentiles. Now he says, my name shall be great among the Gentiles in every place, incense, shall be offered to my name and a pure offering for my name shall be great among the nations says the lord of hosts so that's a prophecy that's an actual word of god who says that in the future that the gentiles will make my name great and it says in every place incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. So I thought about that, and I said, well, geez, is there any church that has incense all over and a pure offering? It, it certainly can be defined as the Eucharist, right? And I'm thinking a pure offering, wow. I just thought about that, and I go, what does this mean? This is like a, a scripture that foretells the future of us being Gentiles. And we're, we are going to, to be connected with God. How are we going to be connected in what way with God? By incense, right? And a pure offering. So I started, started understanding that. And I, I was with my wife and I was reading, I was reading this scripture right here in 2 Thessalonians that really affected me as we were reading the Bible. And it was 2 Thessalonians 2, Verse 15, this is Paul talking, and he says in 15, Therefore, brethren, this is the church, stand fast and hold the traditions which we were taught, whether by word or our epistle. Okay? Whether word or epistle, he was talking about, traditions. And I'm like, traditions? And I asked Luke and my wife, I said, what kind of traditions do we have? I mean, we read the scripture, we're getting into churches that are, modern and and have their own ways to worship and i'm like there's really no traditions in the sense of of uh what paul was talking about and i was thinking what what are these traditions that that this church this church that was established what were these traditions and i realized that these traditions if you start reading in the word of god you'll see in first corinthians um first corinthians 12 it says now I praise you, brethren, it's head coverings, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. There again is traditions. What are these traditions? And he talked about it in um, that chapter in, in verse uh, 3. He says, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of women is a woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head. For that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. So I realize that this really talked about women having head coverings. Now I'm going to show you, actually, right here. I'm going to show you right here. There's pictures of, of the Orthodox faith, women wearing head coverings. And I was like, okay, that's very fascinating. I've learned this after this, but 
they were head coverings. I thought, wow, interesting that this is the church that actually has traditions of women wearing head coverings. Now, you need to understand that I was going through this process of what other traditions, what else is out there with traditions. Other traditions that you'll find is the holy kiss. They would, when the first first church started, when the church was beginning and flourishing, they would have holy kiss with one another and greet one another. They would also have a um, agape meal. After they, after they did the Eucharist, they would have a meal of love that would come together. And I was like, okay, so they have head coverings, they have agape meals, they have the Eucharist, they have the Eucharist every single time they met, that they would have communion every time. And they would also have an agape meal. And I was like, okay, this is really, really fascinating. So this is all in the Word of God that you could see this. And I was, I was really quite surprised. And, and I was thinking, man, these are traditions. Why aren't there churches fulfilling these traditions the way the New Testament church did? Now, as I was analyzing it more and more, I started reading in um, the physical, the governing part of the church, the New Testament church. And I started reading in Matthew 18, 17, and, and it says, and if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So you see the essence of a physical church, of a church being connected. And I thought to myself, well, what is this church? Did it have an organization? Did it have any sort of authority to it? I realized that yes, it did. And as the church was established and, and having this governing order, you see in 1 Timothy 3.12, it says, let deacons be the husband of one, husbands of one wife ruling their children and their own houses as well. I knew that the deacons were absolutely part, okay, part of the church. They were, they were below the bishops and the priests. In 1 Timothy 3, 2, it says, A bishop then must be blameless, a husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach. In Philippians 1, 1, it says, Greetings, Paul and Timothy, bondservant of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are in Philippi, Philippi, sorry, with the bishops and the deacons. Okay, organization, bishops, deacons. There's also scriptures that talk about the elders, right? That the elders were a part of the church. And you start, they're shepherding the flock, right? And you start seeing this, as a matter of fact, this is 1 Peter 5. Um, it says, the elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock, right? This is the position of the elders. So you have bishops, you have elders, you have deacons, right? And I thought, you know, and then there's presbyters who are also priests, right? These are priests. And I'm like, okay, there really was a church. There really was a, an actual governing order of authority. There was a church that came together. As a matter of fact, you'll see it in Acts 2.47, it says, praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Acts 8.3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. This was this is our Paul that was Saul before. He was doing that. He recognized that there was absolutely a church, right? No doubt about it in the beginning. And... And then we see in Acts 9.31, the church prospers. It says, then the churches throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Church, 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 governing body, bishops, deacons, priests, elders. 
you start thinking and go, hold on. <sighs> There's traditions. There were people, men in responsibility and authority to help the church, to help it grow. And then you start coming to the understanding of this scripture. And it says, Matthew 16, 18. And it says, this is Jesus speaking. I was actually there. I was at that location where he said this. And he says, and I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. That's Christ talking. That's a very strong declaration. He knew that there was going to be a build out of the church. He knew, he foresaw, he knew that it was never going to fail. If you believe in Jesus, you've got to believe that he is truly God, that he is the Alpha, he is the Omega, that he is the one that knows the beginning to the end. And he knew it would never fail. He made that declaration. And so if you believe that it failed, then you have to believe in an apostasy. You have to believe that Jesus lied, that you have to believe that actually the, it fell off the throne, that there was no church to be able to save. You have to believe those things. You have to. Because if you don't, then you could say, well, then, you know, hey, it's okay. The Reformation came. Martin Luther did what he did. He basically claimed what? He was against the Roman Catholic Church, right, for what they were doing, that there were people who were paying money to be, uh, uh, you know, delivered from their sins, that, that they would say, hey, it's okay if you're sinning, give us more money, we'll forgive them, right? And he was so upset, he was a monk, in the, in the Roman Catholic faith from Germany, and he put together a 95-point thesis, nailed it to a church, and things changed from that point. That was in 1517, and the Reformation was just the 500-year Reformation just came about. But from that point, you've got to ask yourself, do you, think, do you think that Martin Luther wanted to have all this confusion? Do you think that Martin Luther wanted to have, you know, Luther... Lutheran churches to Methodists or Presbyterians to to Baptists to Anabaptists to to Church of Science to the the uh, Christian Science Church to also the the Church of Christ to to Mormonism to Jehovah Witness to all these non-denominational churches all over the place and then people not believing do you think that's what he anticipated do you expect that he wanted this I don't think he foresaw that I really don't. Um, but one of the things that I've, I've really discovered is that there was one church. There absolutely was one church. And this church that was established was the Church of Rome, the Church of Constantinople, the Church of Jerusalem, the first Christian church, the Church of Antioch, and the Church of Alexandria. And this was the body. This was the Eastern Orthodox, the, the Orthodox Church, I should say, the Orthodox Church. There's one body, one spirit, one unity of faith, one church at that point. And then obviously what happened to the Roman Catholic Church, it changed, right? Because they believed in, in a infallible man that was able to be connected to God, to be able to share his views of how the church should be changed in his decisions of what would happen and that was the papacy and and that was that was the great change that caused the other four churches that was set up and it was an apostolic succession of bishops that's how this council came together at the council of nicaea and and really voted upon things that of administration through through constantine as well as helen because helen wanted uh, his son to organize and legalize the church and put it together because it was always underground for hundreds of years. Many were being persecuted, right? Many Christians were dying. Their heads cut off. They were dying. Um, it was horrible during that period of time for hundreds of years. But we do have information. We have historical evidence to prove that there was a church. You see it in the word of God. Bishops deacons, priests, elders. There is an organization. Proof. And you see that Jesus said that the church would never fail. 
and it didn't. Now you have to question, if you believe in your theology that the church that was organized by the apostles, that it failed, then you have to be in a position to consider that there was an absolute failure of his church. You have to. I don't see how you can't. I don't see how you can't. So I can't reconcile myself to that thought. I can't. I can't go that direction. Because if I said that Jesus really lied, that he didn't know that there was going to be a failure of his church, that in essence, what it would say to me, that Jesus was not God. And he didn't know because the church failed. It was established. It was set up. It was organized. And it was continuing. Now, I've done a lot of videos with a lot of uh, like priests as well as deacons and validating. They validated that, hey, it never failed. There was never an apostasy. There was a schism in 1054 from the Roman Catholic Church to the Orthodox faith. But they're all connected as one. But there was a schism. The Pope sent to the Patriarch of Constantinople. And he said, hey, listen, we're excommunicating you. And the, the patriarch of the Constantinople sent it. Uh, they reversed it. They said, uh, you know, they said, now you're excommunicated from us. But the Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, maintained itself. They maintained itself with the faith, with their tradition and everything else. And so it's done by a council of bishops. I like that idea because if you have one man who is like the voice of of God and and he has the reason from God. If he makes any errors, then guess what happens to the body? They're in error, right? But when you have the the apostolic succession of bishops with the Eastern Orthodox Church that was established, right? They have to actually choose every single view, word, and uh, consideration of how to establish the church and by the Holy Spirit, and they would vote, and they would they would be there. That's what happened to the Nicene Creed. That's what happened to the Council of Nicaea with the Trinity. Every single word that was created was voted upon by the bishops. And so it's really, really important to know all this. It's important to understand it. But you gotta ask the question, you just gotta ask the question consistently. Possibly did, did Luther, did Luther make a mistake? Why didn't he maintain the position of the Eastern Orthodox faith? He was a monk in the Roman Catholic faith. But he, if you find his words, you'll see that he actually considered the Eastern Orthodox Church to be truth. He really did. Reading it, you'll understand that. But he went against the Roman Catholic because he was a monk of the Roman Catholic faith. So anyway, these are some of the things that really started questioning my heart. And I wanted to know what was true and where my journey was led. So I started doing research, found out there was a church and I attend the Church of Antioch, which is, if you go all the way back, you will find, and I can give you the site right here, it's awesome. But um, you will go and see that they have the line of authority going all the way back to Peter and Paul, okay? Because there was a church. As a matter of fact, it's exciting. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but you probably know these scriptures. In the, the, the church of Antioch, right? In Acts eleven twenty six, 26, it says, And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So very exciting, very, um, very exciting because I go, I attend that church. And if you go and do some research, I want you to go to www.antiochian.org uh, forward slash P A T O. F-A-N-T forward slash primates. If you go there, you will see the line of authority from Peter all the way going to the, the current patriarch the, uh, of the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Church of Antioch. Now, you have a lot of different churches, uh, you know, but they're all in, in harmony with each other within the Orthodox faith. So you have, you know, the Russia, Russian Orthodox, you have the Serbian Orthodox, you have, you have the Antiochian, you have the Greek Orthodox, you have all these 
these uh, they call them jurisdictions. They're all connect connected, but they have different culture. I like to go to the Church of Antioch because it speaks English, so I like the English way and i have experienced a lot but i just want to share that with you my journey has been led me to those those areas do i believe that people who are just believers um and you know can be a part of non-denominational presbyterian lutheran all that stuff that they can't be with god no i believe that they can be with god but i do believe i do believe that the um the actual orthodox eastern orthodox church has the fullness has the the medicine to heal you. I really do because I see it in my life. I see the changes that has sanctified me with with God more and to be more connected to him. And I believe uh, the prayers that they have as well as um, the confessions as well as fasting um, really can help and benefit you and to be more focused and connect, connected with your thoughts and, and that you don't desire to sin as much that's that's the medicine those are the tools uh to help you so god bless you guys i i know you're probably thinking dave you're way off and and why would you go back to a religion when you had liberty for me uh i saw so many churches that were light and i i wasn't becoming sanctified uh and and growing in in the spirit in the light of god with many of these churches they were they were nice they're fun the music was good but the Orthodox faith is very, very, very different. And I just have to tell you, all the traditions that I saw in the Word of God are all in the Orthodox faith. So you got to ask yourself, why that? No, why did the everybody leave those traditions? I believe that the the Orthodox Church has those traditions. I believe that if you really, really desire to learn of it, you'll find that 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 the beginnings of, of the Christian faith, it goes all the way back to um, the apostles. You will find that those traditions were very, very important, valuable for everybody. And you will also find that the Orthodox Church uh, put together the Bible. And that's important. And so, you know, we have people say, sola scriptura, sola scriptura. But the reality is what? Well, the reality is the priests and the bishops were teaching the laity, the, the, the believers who were, many of them were unable to even read. The Bible wasn't even there, but they were teaching them through oral traditions. So, and oral theology. So these are important things. This is how it started, guys. This is really, really important for you. So you have to ask yourself, you can do what you want to do. But I, I felt like for me um, and my home, I'm actually home now. I'm home. And that's exciting. So I wanted to give you an idea of all that. God bless you. It took a lot of time, but I know that people wanted to know um, why I decided to move toward orthodoxy. It's a beautiful, rich faith. And there's uh, so many levels of understanding that I think uh, many would be amazed. But God bless you. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Bye-bye.